All right, you guys, good morning. Back for the second day of the, or actually the third day, I think it started Thursday night, of the Professional Bow Hunter Society weekend. Pretty excited for this fun weekend again. There's a lot of great seminars. Um, you know, it's the Ozarks High Point and I'm trying to just keep it authentic on what I do for this every time. So when you actually see this video, there's a couple things like I want to apologize to the Wenzels for being three minutes late. I got to talking bows with people inside and then that little seminar was amazing. But little things like that. I've had to clip a couple of little things for, uh, you know, if uh, things like technical difficulties from the Oasis here, not from the Bow Hunter Society. But anyway, it's been an amazing thing for all these people. We've got new seminars coming today, so. Here we go. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, take as many magazines as you like as well. And if you want these little cards here, just bring a wallet. Morning. Well, it's Chris again from the Ozarks High Point. You know, I'm super excited to be a part of this organization, what they believe in for us traditional guys. Um, it's been a really amazing experience for the people here. But look at all this awesome gear. You're gonna be part of it, you know, you gotta have something. I'm gonna pick this, I think. So, anyway, hope you guys all enjoy this. I've been in, I've been in several dozen. Of all the videos, they tended to be more entertainment with a little bit of educational stuff in them. But more recently, I've decided, you know, to go ahead and hand down some of the, the, the techniques and woodsmanship educational stuff. So I just brought out two new DVDs. It's a two-volume set, and um, they're, they're strictly, I say strictly, almost strictly educational rather than entertainment. I slipped down a couple of jokes here and there, but, you know, most, most of it is, is educational. And it's a lot. I mean, I thought over the years, I thought everybody did this stuff. And I've been finding out they, they don't. I mean, it, it's called the secrets, you know, type of thing. So anyway, I've got these new two DVDs that have been very popular because a lot of my theories are not common knowledge. And I thought, and I've, I, I had those boot camps for 15 years, you know, and had hundreds and hundreds of guys and the old pro doesn't tell all the secrets, you know, but I, I went ahead, I figured at my age, I might as well spill my guts, you know, and hand it down to the, the future generations and stuff. So that's what we're going to do. But anyway, to get rolling here, um, I, I've always thought you got deer hunters, you got buck hunters, and you got trophy buck hunters. Uh, and when I consider, uh, I'm talking a trophy buck, I'm talking about a fully mature Whitetail. I do not consider a buck fully mature until he's five and a half years old. I get a kick on the, the TV guys, you know. They'll, they'll, it'll be a, a half hour show on bow hunting. 25 minutes into the show, this, you know, they say, oh, you know, when the season's coming down and, you know, they'll, they'll hand the bow over and take the, the gun and blast one and they'll shoot a, a three and a half year old or whatever. And then they'll say, well, you know, he's, he's, full, he's mature, he's three and a half, and no, no, I mean, he's not even mature at four and a half. You know, I don't consider a deer fully mature till five and a half. And in, in that breed, that age bracket, as the older they're out there, the smarter they get and stuff. I started to say earlier, I've, because of age, I was forced to slow down. And if anything, it made me a better deer hunter because I would scrutinize, I would slow down and scrutinize what I was looking at. You know, in the early days, you know, I would, I'd walk through and yeah, there's a bed there and there's a bed there and I just keep walking. Now I go over to the beds and I'll look at the, the how they're faced and stuff like that. And you'll learn, okay, and again, a lot of this stuff, a lot of you guys will know, but some of the stuff you won't know, you know, for example, when you've got a, a deer bedded in, the, you see a deer bed in the snow and it's not fully melted, 
you can tell the difference if it's a buck or a doe bed by the urine patch. In other words, when a, when a deer is bedded down, and the, the bed, it looks like a kidney bean or a lima bean type of thing, and, and the deer, when they stand up, the intersects, well, they stand up, usually one of the first things they do is void the bladder and stuff. If you've got a, a bed in the snow, you know, and you look at the yellow spot, if it's a doe, the yellow spot will be right on the, the edge of the bed, whereas if it's a buck, anatomically, the way the buck is, is built, you know, the yellow spot will be in the center of the bed, so you can tell. Then you, you need to look at them. Each bed, if you see a cluster of beds, five, six beds in one area, you'll look at them and you'll notice, if there's snow on the ground, again, you'll notice they're all faced different directions. All right, that's a security factor. In other words, they got deer facing with their eyes all different directions and stuff. The bucks, especially the mature bucks, there might be a young buck with the, the family group, but the, the, the mature bucks will bed separately. They'll be off, and off to the side, usually loners, or they might have a, a buddy coming and so forth, but they'll be off to the side, all right? Anyway, the deer, again, mature deer versus immature deer. Um, the way, and I've used this scenario for years, if you've, if you've got a, a, a ridge, where the bottom of the ridge, say it goes east-west, south this way, north this way, right? And at the bottom of that north ridge, there's a food source, a, a alfalfa field or whatever down there, all right? Physics is, gets involved. In other words, hot air rises, cold air is heavier, cold air sinks, all right? Deer, people assume because deer are mostly nocturnal animals, they'll bed up on top of the mountain for security purposes to have take advantage of the wind. But they, they don't think far ahead. In other words, that the, the bucks will definitely, the mature bucks will, will bed separate from the rest of the herd. So in the afternoon, all day long, hot air rises, all right, they're up in their bed. They don't bed right on the top because on the top they, they're skylined and they won't get as good of, of thermal, the, uh, the smells, thermals and so forth. They'll bed down over the, the, the top on the, the, the uh, uh, leeward side of the mountain. In other words, your, say your predominant wind's coming from the south, this way like this, your thermals are coming up like this, all right? When the thermals, where the thermals meet the predominant wind, it forms like a tunnel. I use the analogy, it's kind of like a surf, the surf, you know, the surfers where it goes, rolls around. That's where they bed. And it's brilliant so that all day long they can smell anything on wind of them and they can smell you know, everything with the predominant wind. They can smell anything, you know, upwind of them with the thermals coming up and they're not skyline. So that's where they'll bed and so forth. In the afternoon, with the, the when the Warm air is still rising. The, the majority of the herd, the bucks, does and immature bucks, does, fawns, etc., will get up from their beds and they'll start to descend the mountain, heading toward the food source with the thermals they can smell, right? They, that's why they enter the field first. The big mature buck is totally different critter, all right? He so remains bedded. your mind, your ear, your that? Your mic. Hi. Where's your mic? Where is it? Oh. Is it? No. Oh, there it is. I just kind of work into it. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, um, where was I? Oh, the mature bucks, they're separate. They will wait until later in the day for, wait for the air to cool and dethermalization. Then the, the big buck will stand up and he'll start to drift down the mountain to the, to the food source, all right? You think about what just happened, all right? In other words, you say, why would he wait till the wind is at his back, etc.? And as he, the thermals are reversing and starting to go down the mountain and stuff. And it's, like I said, it's brilliant because now he's got the rest of the herd standing down in the food source, acting as decoys, you know, and, and he's got the wind in his back. Still going on and on and on. Yeah. Anyway, let me know if, if I lose it. Anyway, he's got the wind at his back, and uh, that's the exact reason. He does the rest of the crew, the rest of that herd is down in the field, and they're acting like decoys type of thing. 
If you bust a button buck out in that field, you don't even know the big boy's there. That's the, that's the reason he's the last one to enter the food source, just before dark type of thing. And uh, um, the exact reverse is true in the morning. In the morning, the first thing, you know, before it's light very often, the big buck, while the thermals are still coming down the mountain with the cool air, he'll leave the food source and head up to the bed. All right, that's the reason he's the last one to enter the field, and it's the reason he's the first one to leave the field in, in the morning and stuff. And as he goes up to his bed, he's got the rest of the herd covering his back door and stuff. You, by the way, you know, I, I, I've mentioned it, these little things I gotta interject while I think of them. A lot of guys have told me, you know, that, that like the coyote problem, we all have coyote problems. Kill every one of them you can, guys. But anyway, the coyotes, they say that, you know, they, they go for the, the weak and the sick and, you know, and all that stuff. And, and I'm saying that coyotes kill more big, fully mature bucks than all the rest of the does and fawns put together. And I'll tell you why. Because just like I said, if you got a herd of deer, immature deer or younger deer, family groups out in the field, and just at dark, the, the man steps out. And the rest, you watch, the rest of the herd, ooh, there's the man, you know, we'll give him, he, he gets respect, we'll give him that corner of the field where the luscious alfalfa is, all right, and he expects that respect. When he confronts, when a, a, coyote, a group of coyotes confront a, a, a bunch of deer, does, fawns, whatever, the first thing that does and fawns do is, whew, they're out of here, they run, they split, right? The big buck, because he has demanded respect with, from the rest of the herd, he will confront that pack of coyotes and, you know, yeah, come on, I'll take you on, type of thing. But what he doesn't put into the formula is there's four or five of them or whatever, and two or three of them will harass his face, and another two or three will come around behind him, hamstring him, and rip that femoral artery out, and he's dead in a minute and a half. I mean, because he challenges them, He's the most vulnerable type of thing. So anyway, I just thought I'd inject that. Um, anyway, as I said, uh, the, uh, the, the rolling of the, the thermals and the way they move, they move totally different than the, the, the rest of the herd and stuff. Um, I, use, I use these analogies of slowing down, looking at details, and I, I've used the analogous, like a doctor looking at an x-ray. You know, you put an x-ray up there in the air, and you know, anybody in the room may look at it and they'll say, yeah, there's the skull and there's the spine, there's the pelvis, et cetera. You know, whereas the doctor's looking at, he's looking at fine details, looking for calcium deposits and hairline fractures or, you know, little tiny bit, you know, things that are variables. And that's what we have to do when we get in the woods looking at, you know, at detail and stuff, slow down, slow down and look at stuff. Um, when I go into a, a new area, the first thing I do is go to the drainages, um, it, it could, the creek bottom. Um, and, and again, it, it depends on the area. Um, I live in Iowa and again, it's mostly hardwoods and you'll have drainages that, that have water in it and other ones that are just dry. I don't know what I'm doing here. But anyway, when I go into a, a, an area, I will walk the drainages first and look, check for the major crossings. And then it, when I cover the depth of the valley between the two ridges, for example, wherever they say there's four major crossings, I'll take those four major crossings and go up and there'll be shelves, etc. And then it goes up and you can follow the movement and figure out the pattern, what's going on before you get into you know to, to the the real details and stuff. Um, there's a lot of things that guys that uh, I was I was starting to talk here about the uh, um, oh different different things that you don't think about the function of a snort for example. You know guys say oh you hear deer snort yeah you know he smells something yeah maybe and you know he, but not necessarily for sure it was you type of thing. The reason they snort is to blow the mucus out of the nasal passages. It, I call it mucus, but it's not. You get it? <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, they blow by blowing the mucus out of the nasal passage. It moistens the orifice, 
and a moist orifice in the nose will pick up scent molecules a lot better than a dry. That's why you see you see the bucks, you know, or the deer, you know, licking their noses all the time. They're moistening that orifice and stuff. Um, as far you know, different functions, different things that you see. Oh, let me say this too. We're talking about deer. I mean, I, I've had buddies. I'll say. You know, I'm sitting in a tree stand and, you know, a little buck came over there from 40 yards and forky and he bedded down, you know, and uh, um, I drew on him four times before he busted me. You know, why did you, why'd you, let, him, why'd you let him bust you? I mean, why did you draw on him? I mean, if I have a, a buck or a deer or whatever bedded down 40 yards over here, you know, watch him. He's, you need, as a hunter, to watch for movement. In other words, that's what you're looking for. That's what he's looking for. In other words, he, he's laying there, and uh, you know he's looking for movement. I, I use the analogy: the the uh, old out, out, outfitters in the uh, in the Montana or out west and stuff, but the pack strings where they'll they'll take a, a spike camp, go up in the mountains, you know, and they'll have a bunch of horses, you know, and the clients are riding behind in the outfitter and stuff like that, and that, that outfitter. He's, he's not looking for elk, he's looking, he's watching that horse, and as soon as you know, you'll see the horse all of a sudden will look over there and, you know, blow, and you look over there 800 yards, and there goes a dozen elk across, and then the guy, you know, the outfitter points to the elk, and the guys are all, you know, they give the, the guy the tip, not the, not the horses, you know, that <laughs> But anyway, you need to look for movement, and this, this is another thing that I brought up, and if you know the answer, you know, don't raise your hand, but I've, I've said this a couple times before, and I've asked multiple deer biologists this, and nobody gave me the right answer and stuff until I, I didn't know the answer until just a couple, three years ago and stuff. And But I'm talking about split ears. I mean, almost all of us have seen bucks, especially with split ears. And, uh, you know, and I thought it was from crawling under a barbed wire fence or getting bracked between, you know, when they're fighting and stuff like that. Well, one day I was sitting, it was like three years ago, I was sitting in a stand, and it was, it was a forky comes over and beds down like 35 yards to the left of me, and I, and I watch him, I'll just watch him, he'll pick up deer coming, but he was laying, he was bedded down, he was sleeping. I mean, I could see his eyes closed, and they'd open him up and look around a little bit, you know, and his eyes closed and stuff like that. Anyway, it, sheer coincidence, I just happened to look at the right second. I looked over like that, and he was, he was almost sleeping like this, and here comes an owl, comes flying in, grabs this dude's right ear, all right, the owl thing. Of course, the, the buck freaks out and goes this way, and the owl freaks out and goes this way, guaranteed, you know, that's where some of their ear rips come from and stuff, you know, just, just little things like that that you, you see and stuff uh, that are interesting. Um, I'm gonna refer to these things because, just on quick points, I don't even know. I get it. Well, I guess I'm only supposed to talk for 45 minutes, but my point is, uh, any, anything, well, no, any, anything over 45 minutes, I go on time and a half. Anyway, I get back, you know, the, the, uh, the, the function of this, you know, like the, the snorks, and we, we already talked talk about that and stuff. Okay, movement. On as far as the air currents, all right, same thing, different scenarios I point out, and in the video, it's a lot of videos, it's a lot easier to understand because I, I do them schematically, put it on, I got it on here now, okay, thank you. Anyway, um, schematically, I, I draw it out so you understand it, but say, you, say you've got a, a ridge going east-west, north this way, south this way. Where I live, the predominant wind direction is south, southwest, something like that, so it's going across this way and so forth. If you look in the hardwoods, very often um, you'll see, and you've got to look for it a lot of times, you'll see the remnants of an old logging road, all right? And you think about it, in other words, it's a flat on top of the ridge and it drops down on this side and it drops down on this side, all right? Where that old logging road came, it was when they, when they logged it 50, 60, 70 years ago, they logged it with horse horses and it's easier to draw, take the, the timber, either with equipment or horses, easier to get the, the logs out on a flat surface rather than down over the hill. So there'll be the remnants of a logging road. You look, scrutinize those, that, that logging road 
and you'll see, oh man, there's a bunch of tracks on there and stuff, right? The average guy will look at that and, and, and he's smart enough to hook it on the downwind side, put his tree stand 15, 20 yards off of that logging road. How many times you heard it? He, you know, he's got the wind in his face, he's got all this, you know, tracks right in front of him, and he'll say, oh man, the biggest buck of my life, and he came in right behind me. Duh. You know, that's because that's where he was supposed to. In other words, the deer, the, the, especially the big mature bucks, will, will, they'll have a separate distinct trail on the downwind side over the crest on the side of that hill like that. So that, and it, it's brilliant, the way that they take this stuff normally for granted. I mean, that's the way that they live type of thing. So he's heading from his bedding area to the food source out this way on that secondary trail down over the side. And as I said, you think about the logistics behind it. He's got a, the predominant wind coming across like this. So anything upwind, he can smell, he can see down into the timber. So he's over the crest, he's not scarring, he can look down and see in the hardwoods. So he can see what he can't smell and smell what he can't see. That's where you want to set up 15 or whatever yards downwind of the secondary trail. I mean, just that point right there will increase your, your percentage on big bucks 100% type of thing. Um, things like, well, guys ask me, you know, like when you scrape hunt, do you prefer to scrape hunt in the morning or the afternoon? And there's a definite difference there. And this stuff has all been documented, but just a lot of people don't, don't know it and stuff, you know. Is it for me? <laughs> Trump keeps calling me. <laughs> anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah, morning for morning for afternoons and stuff. Deer know, and they, my brother and I go around about this all the time. You know, yes, they can't reason, but a lot of stuff is not reasoning; it's instinctive. Okay, and deer realize that most deer in the herd or sleeping at night, or going or her, you know, I'm sleeping during the day and going around all night, you know, cruising and checking the fields and checking does and all that stuff. So in the morning, a lot of, of deer will bed, especially the dominant bucks. If you have a, a primary breeding scrape where there's a lot of activity, um, and remind me about the bear and bear traps and stuff. Anyway, the, a, a good big mature buck will bed down right near a primary scrape. So consequently, the, the subordinate bucks or sometimes even other dominant ones, they'll scent check that scrape rather than come in physically and actively and work it and so forth. The afternoon, in other words, they think they know that the, in the afternoon, the big buck that might be bedded there in the morning or in the daytime, he's, maybe he left and he's headed for the fields to you know, chase those all night. Then in the afternoon, they'll actively come in and work the scrape. So in the mornings, they sent check them and more in, in the afternoons, they'll actually, actually go in and work the scrape itself. Um, I said, remind me about the bear. I mean, all of us here, uh, raise your hand if you've hunted bear over a bay you know, somewhere. I mean, yeah, almost every hand in the room goes up. Right, okay. If you have a bear bay in where, in where there's multiple bear working that barrel or that bay, et cetera, and it's a pecking order, dominant, uh, you know, second or uh, subordinate type of thing. Uh, a dominant bear will very often bed down close to that bait and take it over, so to speak. A subordinate bear will, will he know, if he walks right in, he's going to get, very likely get ambushed and, you know, maybe, you know, get in a fight and get his butt whooped or maybe even killed type of thing. <coughs> if you look close in the, the, the area around that bay, you'll see pad marks, distinct separate pad marks, this thing keeps going out, um, right in front, going going to the bait barrel. In other words, they'll step, they'll put their feet, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, so they can sneak in to the bait and determine if there's a big guy there, rather than just walk right in and get ambushed and so forth. I do the same things on my, on my deer stands and stuff. And it don't, not all of them, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I'm, talk, I'm not talking, I do this in every stand, I do it in particular, certain stands. If you've got a stand, and I used a, an example on the videos where there was a, 
a ridge going like this and then a, 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 a bowl type of thing and another finger ridge and then another <coughs> bowl, all right? The main bedding area is, is it happens to be north this way. The, this south predominant wind is on that ridge over there. They're facing this way. The stand is on the secondary, and all, very often the, the deer, when they get up from the beds, they'll make a circuit and it'll run those those fingers, etc. Right? Most guys don't think far enough ahead. When they enter the stand, which is on top of the secondary finger, they'll walk right in and walk right down the ridge, knowing that the, the, the deer are on the next ridge, thinking they're not disturbing them. All right? Major mistake. You know, you come in, and this is all done pre-season, pre-season, pre-rut. Uh, I normally do this after, right around the end of October, 1st of November. And I also do this on days that are not good hunting, like a real windy day or a rainy, stormy day or whatever. Go in, get it done, and I might have eight, nine, ten, whatever stands that I do this to. All right? I have a, a, a it, I, I've tried the leaf rakes and the garden rakes and, and the, they, the, the, the wide ones are too wimpy, you know, and the, the ones with the stiff teeth, they, they grab the leaves, they were, you gotta, you're constantly pulling up. I use a, a hoe, it's, a, it's probably uh, seven, eight inches, the blade is seven, eight inches wide. It's got a fork thing at the thing, you know, and I just turn it sideways and I use it like a, like a, a hoe, like a rake. I got a hoe and my wife knows it, you know. But anyway, I, uh, I'll rake uh, for maybe 50 yards. Say your, your, your stand is on the top of that finger, all right? And I used an example, and I showed before and after, all right? Um, if you walk through six inches of dry cornflakes on the way to that stand, I mean, you'll, I guarantee you, you'll bust deer left and right, all right? And that, that buck is laying over there on that other ridge with the wind in his back, face this way, and he hears you enter, and he just stands up in one jump, he's over the crest, and you don't even know he was there, type of thing. So 50 yards or so, this side of that finger ridge of my stand, where I think the bucks are bedded, I'll put the, the stand, like a pitch and a double or triple, you know, cluster of trees. I'll put the stand over there, I mean in there, like that, and I'll take, and I'll rake out footprints, right foot, left foot, right down to bare earth, right up to the stand, rake the leaves away, 100%, and trust me, I've done it dozens of times, where I'd go into the stand, I'd sneak in, you know, there's no way you could get in there with without raking a, a bare spot, that thing. Entrance exit is one of the most important things in, you know, successful hunting. But I'll sneak in there, perfectly quiet, get up in the stand, you're sitting there 20 minutes and all of a sudden you'll see an ear flicker over there and you look, you look over and, you know, you know, there's a 150 inch spot bedded there and all, you know, 10 minutes later he stands up and here he comes. And I guarantee you would not have had the opportunity to get that shot had you not done that type of thing. I don't do it to all of them. Another thing that people don't, uh, uh, one of the most common comments I had after these boot camps were how low some of my stands are, all right? But trust me, but try, I'm not, I'm not uh, afraid of heights. I mean, the, the highest tree stand I used to hunt was 33 feet, and I hated it. I don't like the angles, all right? Normally, I, I try, to, I like 15, 12 to 15 feet, but, um, and I, hang with me on this, I, I tested this myself and proved it to myself. I tend to hunt cedar trees a lot, but where, you know, you might get one or two cedars or a little cluster in one area of the hardwoods. The cedar will, you know, keeping the leaves being softwood will uh, tend to, you know, give you a little bit more cover and so forth. Um, I had this one scenario, and this was like, five, six years ago. Um, there, was this, uh, there was just a little tiny cedar in, uh, in the right spot. And it was the only cedar in that whole area. And it was a, a morning stand. And uh, I would come in you know, to the stand um, and te I tested this. I stood on I a fully ghillie suit, fully camouflaged, gloves, mask, the whole works, right? And I would stand there, and in this particular scenario, the, the food source to the bedding ground, so it, the main run, main trail came by, it was like 12 yards from the tree, 
type of thing, and I stood on the ground, not batting an eye, all right? And it happened uh, uh, three different times. But here comes three does, and they're, they're totally relaxed. They had a perfect win. They walked by, and they turned their head and looked at me, and <laughs> you know, they blew up and exploded, you know, you know, and I hadn't blinked, all right? And then, whatever, a half hour later, here comes three more. Anyway, I did that a couple days in a row, and I got busted every time standing there not even blinking, all right? Then I brought, to prove it to myself, I brought in, it, it's the, the top section of a ladder stand. I measured it. My feet were 48 inches off of the ground. Four feet off of the ground. Did this probably the same deer. Here they come, walking by. They look over at me in the chew and cut. Never hesitated, never faltered, you know, ne never missed a beat type of thing. The secret is why, you know, they detect you when you're on the ground and not four feet elevated is light intensity. When you're standing on the ground, I don't care how camouflaged you are, you're solid. Light's not going through you. You get 48 inches off of the ground, they can see underneath of your feet. 100% improvement and stuff like that. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying yeah, Wenzel puts all his tree stands at 48 inches, you know, no. Um, but I do, I, I do tend to keep them lower. I would rather be low in a softwood with, you know, good background and sky, you know, rather than be up 20 feet with sky behind you and stuff where you're backlighted and so forth, you know. Um, another thing, scent molecules. I, I'm not going to get into this in detail I did on the videos, but I'm a firm, scent molecules, I, I, I kind of refer to, it's kind of like a, a mist, I mean that's a, a chapter micro, but what I'm saying is scent will carry a lot farther when it's elevated. Um, I'll take, a, 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 actually I use ladies Tampax, if you do it, tell your wife why you got the Tampax in your backpack. Stuff. I'll dip the Tampax in a, a, a dough and heat, and I do. I go through a procedure and so forth, but you don't have to go that far. You can just uh, you, you take a, a, a tree step, something with weight, and, and tie it to a, a rope, and you can throw it up over a limb, or you know, and and have it come down and stuff, and then tie your scent rag or whatever on there and elevate it and so forth. Scent molecules. 20, 25 feet up in a tree will carry 10 times farther than it will if you just put them on the ground or, you know, at, at eye height or whatever and stuff like that. You know, these little things and stuff that I've done for years. Okay, here's another good one that I, I'm going to say I was probably uh, eight years old, nine years old, and I, my dad was a good deer hunter. And I remember him teaching me, he said, uh, um, if you got a buck standing there, broadside looking at you, all right? And if you, whether you're hunting with a gun or a bow, if you raise your weapon vertically, you know, in other words, like that, and then draw it back, you've got a chance. But if you try to come in horizontally with either a bow or a gun, they'll nail you every time. And just here, and I found out it was true. I tested it type of thing. And just a few years ago, I started researching it. I don't, frankly, I don't know where my dad got his info. I mean, this is back in the 50s, I and mean, they didn't, nobody even knew that. You know, the only thing was available was outdoor life and field and screen and stuff, you know. But anyway, he was absolutely dead right. And it has, it has to do with the rods and cones in the, in the deer's eye. The rods are good for motion and light sensitivity, and the, the cones are, are good for color and high resolution and stuff. You think about the logistics behind it. In other words, a deer is, is a prey animal. Predators come at them for a normal, meaning that, you know, dogs, coyotes, lions, bobcats, whatever, you know, uh, humans for that matter, you know, they come at them horizontally. That's why their eye picks up as a prey animal, the predator coming in. The exact opposite is true on predators. They have, you know, the vertical, you know, type of thing. You know, so, Keep that in mind. If you if you have a deer looking at you, you know, raise your weapon vertically, and you got a chance. Don't you know, bring it in horizontal and stuff. Uh, here's another thing. I don't I don't know how to pop up lines that much, but 
um, you'll note, I've seen this many times, a guy will set a pop-up line, whatever, at a food source or whatever, and uh, um, the, you'll, you'll notice the fact that, um, I lost my train of thought, wait a minute, um, oh, the windows. A lot of guys will face their shooting window to the west in the afternoon. Major mistake, meaning the sun's going down. Uh, say they got a big out there, a food store or whatever, and the deer coming in, in in the afternoon. If you've got the, the pop-up window, the w window, even the screened window, facing towards the sun, that low sun coming light will come in and illuminate you inside the blind. So if you're if you have the option to put the thing in the afternoon, face it to the to the east, right? So the sun's going down at your back. Not only do they have the sun in their eyes, but it's not shining in. I learned that in Zimbabwe. I went into a native village, and I'm talking mud huts with fast screws. And uh, the PH said to me, he says, notice that their doors are, are all facing to the west. And I, I said, huh, you know, and he said, you know why that is? And I said, no, not really. And he says, uh, says because the setting sun in the west will give them another 10 or 15 minutes of daylight inside the hot type of thing rather than the other way around type of thing, you know. Just using their common sense and stuff. Um, I talked about the, uh, the low stance. There's another one, and I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, I used to, I, I'd go to the, the artificial Christmas trees. I started, you know, you can get them on eBay or whatever and they're like, you know, they're, if they're eight footer, there's two four foot sections, if they're nine footers, they're three three foot sections or whatever. But I'm talking the phony artificial Christmas trees, all right? You can you can get wait till right after Christmas and stuff. You can go to go to the dump and get them for free. But you can go on eBay now and they're like 25, 30 bucks and stuff. All right, I'll take the three, say it's a nine foot Christmas tree. I'll take the three three foot sections. I did that math in my head. Okay. Anyway, I'll take the three three foot sections and I'll I'll zip tie them to branches behind me and stuff to give me more cover around the hardwoods and stuff, right? Then I started elaborating on that, and in fact, it was it the year before last. I was just coincidental. My wife and I were going through Walmart. It was like January or something, and they had all the Christmas stuff on sale. And they got these garlands, which the garlands are the, along, they're like nine, ten feet long and three, four inches in diameter, pine needles, right, on the wires type of thing. And the people, they use them for wrapping around the banisters and their porches and stuff like that, uprights and stuff like that. Well, anyway, I was walking by, and they were normally like four bucks or something like that each. And they had them on sale for 50 cents, you know. I bought 52 of them. <laughs> <laughs> they really looked at me funny when I was you know. But anyway, then I went home and told my buddy, and he went to a different Walmart and bought 40 more. I mean, they're excellent. You can use them like on ladder stands, then in the uprights. Okay, if you you have branches around you, worm the, you know, the, a 10-foot, you know, garland all behind you and stuff. It breaks up your silhouette. I mean, a, a great, great tip and stuff. Um, I was, what, what else are you going to say about that? Uh, uh, I lose my train of thought all the time. But, uh, anyway, let me see if I can refresh it. I'm not looking at the... Uh, oh, yeah, the TV thing. I do the same thing, and as I said, it's just common sense. Where, and I've said this a million times, I'd rather have a, a great tree in a mediocre spot rather than have a mediocre spot and, and, and a mediocre tree in a great spot type of thing. But say, say here's your tree, all right? That's where your stand's gonna be, and it's in the open. You need more cover around it, all right? Not only can you use the garlands, and like I said, you know, for a couple more bucks, you can make that stand, you know, 10 times better by adding cover around it. All right, but say here's the tree and it's too open, all right? A hinge cut, I'll take another tree. You go out there, and it depends on the situation, but you go out there 30, 40 feet or whatever, and I usually, and any time you do this, make sure you got permission from the landowner. But I'll take a tree that's maybe four or five inches in, in diameter, okay? And here's your tree with the stand, and hinge cut it, 
Try not to kill the tree, but I'll cut it halfway and then tilt the crown of the tree over towards your tree stand and take another one and do it over here and another one and do it over here. So you, you end up with a drink. No, you end up with your, your tree stand is has a cluster of crowns all around it. And you climb up the, the, the ladder or the tree stand or whatever and just cut yourself some shooting holes. That, that little tip itself will make that stand 10 times better than it would be if you didn't do that type of thing, you know. Um, even, try not to kill the tree, but even if you kill the tree, the leaves, well, it'll be good for that season, but the leaves will fall off and it, it, they'll end up being, the, the skeleton will remain there type of thing. That skeleton, you can add the garland to or fresh cut leaves, leafy branches next year or whatever. I mean, it, but it'll improve that stand up 100% type of thing. Manipulating deer, you know, I'm my big, I got a bum arm and, you know, I, I am not the shot I used to be. I try to keep all my shots, you know, at 15 yards. Was, I've got that, at my booth out there, I got that banner thing in the back you know, I'm trying not to brag, but every one of those bucks I've killed with a recurve under 15 yards. And people say, how do you do it? How do you do it? You know, and it's little little things like this, you know, that, that tips and stuff to try to create an easy shot. Most guys, you see them? You sneeze? Yes. Yeah, right. I can teach you how to not sneeze I mean, in it. <laughs> if you're in a tree stand, uh, Remind me to come back to what I was talking about, whatever I was talking about. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm shifting it here. Um, anyway, if you're in a tree stand and you have a sneeze coming on, you know, the noise, what it is, is air escaping from your lungs. So the millisecond, millisecond before you sneeze, <gasps> exhale, blow all the air out of your lungs. There's nothing in there and just pinch your nose and it'll go. Your show will go, that's, that's it, man. I mean, you can sneeze. I've had bucks feeding on acorns 15 yards from me and I sneezed three times and they didn't, they didn't even lift their heads, that type of thing, you know. I'll teach you tomorrow, I'll teach you how to tie your shoes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, back to this shifting gear movement, all right. And I had a, I, on the videos, I did a scenario and pointed this out and stuff. See, you've got a ridge going this way like this and a food source is this way and the, the, the bedding is this way and the predominant wind is south to north, right? The best tree is 25 yards from the main edge where the, the main trail pattern and stuff. I'm not a 20, I'm a 15 yard guy now, right? So I want to shift those deer 10 yards toward my the best tree, all right? So here's the run where the deer have been using every day for their whole lives and stuff. I'll pick a tree on the, the up, down one side type of thing of the of the uh, the one, all right, and I'll hinge cut it. Now this is the important part: the angle that you drop the tree. Same thing. Try not to kill the tree. I can't do that one. I've got a little bit on it, but okay, all right. The deer are going this way. Your tree's over here. Between that trail and your stand, you cut the tree at an angle at a 45, going like this with the with the crown off to your right type of thing, all right? If you put it perpendicular, sometimes they'll, they'll jump it or go under it or whatever. If you cut the tree with a crown this way, they'll go around it this way. So it's important to cut the tree at a 45 with the crown on this side, all right? Then I'll take my hoe and I'll take a rake, rake the leaves right down to bare earth. It's dirt and stuff and it creates a visual, right? So now, you, you know, here's the deer that walked that same trail every day of his life, going to his bedding area. He, you know, again, he's he's got the wind coming across like this. He can see, or I mean, he can smell anything upwind. He can see anything downwind. All right, he he'll there, oh, there's a tree down where I always walk, type of thing. And because the crown is over here, that's bulk. He'll follow along the thing, and he'll shift it. And then he oh, there, there's a a trail right in the lead, right down to the bare earth. You've shifted his movement from 25 yards to 15 yards, and there's the boogie man sitting in the stand right there, he'll walk right by you and stuff. And this is this is not cheating, this, this is smart hunting. I mean, it's just, it, in other words, in fact, it's good for the sport. Most of us 
are better shots at 15 yards than you are at 25 or 28 yards type of thing. So shift them over and you'll you know, decrease the, the wounding rates and stuff. Um, uh, the hedge apples, you know, in the Midwest they have Osage, you know, with hedge apples. And I've done, I've preached this for years. I get a kick, the, the guys on the PB guys, you know, if they normally they're in a shooting house or a food plot. But if, they, if they're in the woods, here comes a buck walking by and they'll, he'll get right before his shooting lane and they'll, you know, be bleed or, you know, run or whatever. Make a noise or whistle or say something to him or whatever. And it's stupid. I mean, you know, they're, they're the deer, he's walking nonchalant, he gets right in the shooting lane and the guy goes, Bleh. you know, and the deer looks up at him and then he draws. And, you know, give me a break. I mean, if you're going to shoot, why don't you draw first and then make the sound? But, you know, even that's dumb. I mean, in other words, I'll take a, a hedge apple. And if you don't, if you don't have head, uh, you know, Osage trees, I and mean, for those of you who don't know, if we're not from the Midwest or whatever, the hedge apple, the fruit of it, it, it looks like a grapefruit. It's got the little squirrely line. It looks like a brain, and so forth. And you you roll that. And you, I'll take a a a, a dough and heat scent, and I'll put a bead of it around the hedge apple, climb up in a tree, and there's your shooting lane right there, and say the deer are going left to right, I'll roll it out, I call it bowling for bucks, you roll it out, and the thing will roll across their trail, and it'll leave enough scent, trust me, on the trail, and because deer are familiar with directional tracking, they'll come up, they're, they're totally nonchalant, they'll step right into your, your shooting lane, They'll smell where that hedge, that dough and heat rolled across the trail and stuff, and they'll look, because of directional track, they'll look the other way, and they'll give you a standing broadside shot at a perfectly relaxed deer. I hate when that happens here. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, if, you, if there's no hedge apples, you can use them. Check, make sure, check your fishing game. You know, again, you can use apples if you want. You know, but you know, you don't want to get nailed for baiting or whatever because you rolled an apple across the trail or whatever type of thing. But little things like that to get them, get them, set up the situation to get them to stop where you want it and, and stuff like that. Oh, here's another thing. I'll give my brother credit for this one. For those of you, as we can, I look around at the room here and we all probably have, have readers and stuff. I mean, I don't even know what mine are, 250 power or whatever, okay, but you go to the, go to the dollar store. Serious, this is an excellent, excellent tip. Go to the dollar store and buy the cheapest pair of, of readers you can get and the lowest power, 100 or 125 power is the lowest one to stuff. Keep in your fanny pack. When we're blood trailing a deer, you know, and you're, you're you're walking, it's kind of like trying to read a newspaper at home without the readers on. It's just not in focus. You put the, the 100 power on like that, you can walk right, it'll, it'll clear it up, you know, 100% stuff. Um, another thing, I'm just going to, but I'm, I'm not even on a second page. Okay, anyway, um, um, I'll say this, over the years, this is just little things I found out, I've proven to myself. I'll say this, I don't care where you live, you know, the first, well, if you had lived in the south, you're hurting, but the first hard frost of the year, you better get your butt in a, in a tree stand. That, the, I found out the first hard frost of the year will be one of the best days of hunting in an entire year, especially if it's been warmer before, you know, been 50, 55 degrees, and all of a sudden one night, you know, a, a frost always will come drop down to 23 or 25 or whatever, there will be deer movement all day, all day long. I mean, it's it's excellent. So whatever you have to do to get the, the day off and stuff like that. Um, let me look here. I know there's stuff that uh, I want to make sure. Oh, it's another thing regarding that. If you notice well, first of all, us, I don't know, say this part of the country, up north, you know, I do these semi, you know, did seminars all over, in, a, in you know, the United States. And I've done them in the deep south, where there'll be a room like this, and I'll say, raise your hand if you've never seen snow. And, you know, give me a break. Half of the room raises their hand, you know, and they live in the south, and, you know, what a learning tool. 
you know, to be able to take a track on snow and understand the movement and stuff. And I've preached this for 40 years. Um, rather than like the trackers, you know, you know the, the guys from New England especially, they'll take a buck track and they'll get on it and they'll dog it and stuff like that, keep after them and so forth. Well, as soon as they dump that deer, that deer's running for his life. He's in defensive mode, all right? But as a learning tool, what you need to do, I used it when I lived in Montana. I, you know, I would go to an area that did not have very many deer, uh, minimal deer, and I would pick up a big, a good big buck track type of thing. As a learning, it didn't even have to be seasoned, and I would walk it backwards. You backtrack them. And it, I use the analogy, it's similar to picking up a mystery novel and uh, you know, not going to the back of the book and find, find out who done it. In other words, you can see, you'll see the, 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 the deer track, you're on a deer track and you'll come to a bed and you'll see how, check the wind, how did he enter that bed, why is, which way he's facing, et cetera, like that. And you follow it back and you'll come to a scrape and you'll say, you know, say, oh yeah, okay. he, you know, he picked up three does here and he traveled with them. Find you, you walk back and then again, he left with none of them were in heat, so he had, you know, went off on his own. You'll learn more in one day of backtracking than you will in weeks of following a deer, the, you know, the normal way and stuff. Um, um, I, I want to, again, let's see. Oh, another thing, smoke bombs. I use smoke bombs all the time. <laughs> the legality and so, so forth, I mean, you can go, you know, but, Go to the fireworks stand, you know, and buy yourself some smoke bombs. I do it on all, when I put a new stand in, I do it all, all the time, that thing. And I'll normally do it three times to check variations and stuff. But I'll, I'll put the smoke bomb up on the, the platform of the stand type of thing, light it, and you'll be able to see whatever blue or orange or whatever color smoke it is, where it drifts, how it drifts, you know, through the temper. Molecules, scent molecules are similar to invisible water type of thing. And you'll see, I mean, there was one, one stand, I would, it was in a valley, and it was a pretty wide valley. I, I didn't think I was going to get busted. But anyway, I was in this stand, and it, it was, the, the wind was coming this way, and there was a big hardwood ridge across there, I mean, two, three hundred yards over there type of thing. And I had deer snorting up on that ridge. The wind's strong going this way. Like that, and I had deer up there snorting, you know, and I thought it was a trespasser or something you know, like that. So I brought a smoke bomb in, and that stand put it, and it was perfect. It goes like this. I remember it was blue. A blue smoke bomb it goes like this, like this, and got about 50 yards behind me, did a big dewy, and went right over top of my head. I mean, they were smelling me 300 yards upwind, you know, type of thing, you know. You can learn the patterns and stuff. The scent molecules, if, I mean, again, we have to realize our, we tend to, to associate their sense of smell with my, with our sense of smell. And it's just like I said, you, you need to learn, you know, how acute their sense of smell is and how they, they live every day of their lives on messages they receive from their, their noses and eyes and ears and stuff. But anyway, my, my point is that if you say you're walking in a two track, a normal two track in hardwoods, all right? And I'm talking a logging road where there's a rut here and another rut here, and say the wind is going, say it's going east west and the south wind's going across like this, and that because of the rut and that there's a hump in the middle, the hump is a little, tends to be a little more level. Most guys will either you know, walk, don't think, think about it at all, they'll walk the, the grass in the, the, the middle between the ruts. Got a triple, got a, Okay, well, this one and then just one more quick one. Anyway, my point is, well, if you have to go like that, don't walk in this tr this tri tire track because if the scent from the molecules from your, your entrance exit will drift across and permeate the center and that right. If you walk in, going that way, you walk in in this rut like that, the scent will drift off the road and this will remain virgin and stuff. He's telling me to wrap it up, but I gotta, I gotta show you this. Um, you're gonna, I just was, uh, I just hog hunted in uh, Oklahoma the last two weeks and stuff. And I'll say this: this works great for either hog or deer and stuff. But 
this guy who had the, the land I was hunting on, he had uh, some deer feeders out. And uh, it was one of those deals that he had the feeders set for 5 o'clock, you know, type of thing. So every day in the evening at 5 o'clock or whatever, 7 in the morning, the feeder would go off, right? And I, I came up with this. And it, what you need, it's an empty soup can. You put 24 kernels of corn in here. Not 23, not 25, 24, right? And then an hour before, like at 4 o'clock, every 15 minutes, 4 o'clock, 5, 4, 15, 4, 30, and right after, you just, you hold this baby up and do, do one of these. It, it sounds like the, the kernels of corn hitting the blade on the spinner. And often, the, the family groups will lay bedded out in the, you know, right up out and they're listening for that corn to go off or that feeder to go off and stuff. I never tried it myself, but allegedly um, Don Thomas said it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's anyway, we'll, we'll leave on that note and stuff. So I'll, I'll be back at the, the, the brief. The thing that I'm Yes, it'll be up for auction tonight. <laughs> Custom homemade. <laughs> so did you jack it up for next year? Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's nothing but luck. Meaning, uh, in other words, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. It just,